It is Wednesday, in fact, the 13th of January, and I'm very pleased to welcome back two authors who've appeared at the Poison Pen before, and we're always happy to see them. Lee Goldberg on the left in blue with an incredibly neat office, and Jason Pitter <laughs> on the right you. with, with uh, a bike in the background, and conceivably family members will drop in, but, you know, I think part of the charm of doing this is the informality of There's our events. There's a dead body on the floor, but you can't see it. I have cleaned all the cocaine off my keyboard. The strippers are outside the door. I'm presenting a very low-key version of myself for all of you. Well, there I was kind of hoping it would go in a different direction. Anyway, um, the guys have several things in common that they've reminded me of, um, which is that they have had the... Um, Let's see, they're star-crossed in the sense that last year, when they did the first book in each of these series, Lost Hills by Lee Goldberg, inter introducing uh, Eve Ronan, and um, Hideaway, introducing Rachel, is it Marin or Marin? I'm never sure how you pronounce Marin. Yeah, Marin. Marin. Rachel Marin. Yeah. Um, and that was just as the pandemic took hold. In fact, Jason was here the very night um, before he flew to San Diego for Left Coast Crime and it shut down yeah. right in front of him, so to speak. And yeah. Lee, were you there too? Same problem? Oh yeah, I think I had the last panel before the health department came in and said, okay, Goldberg's infected everybody with his god-awful books. We're shutting the whole place down. I right. still remember seeing I, Jason slumped over his turkey sandwich at the bar. <laughs> all the way across the country for this sandwich. Yeah. And yeah. I, remember, I remember going down to the book room to see the books, and there's a giant tarp over all you believe on There's a giant tarp over the over the book table saying, "We are no longer selling books. Our booksellers went home and wait." So it's like all of a sudden there are like 300 authors there and no books for sale. And I was like, "Oh, this is this is going to get worse." I had done a panel with Kent Kruger and and Catherine McPherson and and uh, Lori King, and then right after the panel, my wife and I went sightseeing. We had like two hours to kill or something before the next thing I had to do at Love Coast Crime. And I get a text from my brother saying, how does it feel to have shut down the conference? What are you talking about? <laughs> Todd told me that the second after I left, the health department swooped in and shut it down. I was like, oh, well, I guess we yeah. can spend the rest of the day sightseeing, honey. Right. Well, San Diego, San Diego is a lovely place. And after all, Jason, your flight across the country at least stopped in Scottsdale, so it wasn't completely wasted. And, and it, was, it was worth it just for that. But the good news is that what we have now, tonight, there are second books in these two series that we introduced last February. And I'm really pleased to say, because second book syndrome is something that many authors have flinched, wept, and, you know, retreated from, that in this case, both second books live up to the first books. So it'll be fun to well, talk you. about them. Thank you. That's, well, that's really nice, yeah. And, you know, I really thought your first books were excellent. Um, both experienced writers, you've got lots of books between you and print, Lee. Lee has written for television, he's written for the movies, he's written for other authors, he's written many things of his own, um, and, you know, I've so. been writing John Grisham for years, Barbara. <laughs> Did I ever tell you about the time that I inadvertently unmasked the Jessica Fletcher guy? No, this I, is, I inadvertently unmasked him. I know this is totally off story. point, but it's truly one of my very favorite stories, and unfortunately he's now deceased, and I, I can't remember... I'm having Donald, a, Bain. Because of that. Donald, Donald Bain, Bain. <laughs> thank you very much. So we had a request, uh, and I don't remember how many years ago it was, that Donald Bain uh, would do an event, and I took him up to the Cave Creek Library because they had a really excellent mystery program in the afternoon. And Donald Bain was there with his wife, and I was baffled by the fact that any number of the people streaming into the library were wearing TWA uniforms with caps. And I thought, what is going on here? And it turns out that Donald Bain was the author of Coffee, Tea, or yeah. Me, and subsequent sequels under whatever pseudonym it was that, that he wrote those. Well, yeah. I had another experience with Wait, Donald. Wait, no, Bain. I'm not done. A... No, 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 oh, you can't sorry. interrupt me. That was the first moment that I, I figured that there was something going on with Donald Bain. Anyway, we are talking about his current Jessica Fletcher book, but before we got started, I looked at this room full of people and I said, well, now that we've unmasked Donald Bain as the author of Coffee, Tea, and Me and sequels, I said, it may surprise some of you to know that there are many books authored 
um, in the name of a well-known person who um, didn't actually write the books. And I said, looking right at Donald Bain, just for the fun of it, not knowing anything, I said, for example, there's the whole Margaret Truman series. And his face went completely white. And, you know, and his wife kind of squirmed in her chair. And I looked, I said, oh my God, I said, was it really you writing Margaret Truman, all of those books? Yes, he said. And then he said, you can't tell anybody. And, you know, I felt, I mean, truly, it was a completely spontaneous, unrehearsed, ignorant moment for me, but it was hilarious. Mine was more deduction. Uh, he and I were friends, and he, I knew he ghosted other authors, and he was complaining about how there's this one big author he was writing for, and that author was going on the Today Show and saying, oh, I'm getting tired, I'm thinking of laying down my pen. And Donald would yell at the TV, you've never picked it up except to sign the books that I've written. And also, that he'd sit across from publishers saying, God, we wish we could get another, I'll make this name up, you know, Irv Schmelzer book. If only we could find an author like Irv Schmelzer. And Donald was like dying inside going, I am Irv! But, you know, he would talk about these things enough that I began to correlate some of the TV and other experiences he was talking about. And I said, I just read your new book. He said, I don't have a book out. I said, sure, I read the new Irv Schmelzer. But how did you know? Keep your mouth shut. That's a deduction. He said, you can't say a word or I'm finished. But uh, it was funny. And you know, then he told me the rest, You know that he was Margaret Truman, that he no. was the coffee tea or me girls. You know, he hired stewardesses to be his front. In fact, I've tried to hire stewardesses to be my front <laughs> for interviews like this, and I've had a hell of a time. Well, I, that we digressed, but I've always, I just love that story. So, and he's passed on now and somebody else is writing the Jessica Fletcher. But you, Lee, have always, at least as far as I know, um, actually taken credit for the books that you have written. Um, there are some I'd like to disavow if you have a minute. Well, that, I wasn't going to go there. But so, Jason, meantime, you have got something like a million books in print. You've written, what was it, like a six or seven book series before you've taken to Rachel? And one standalone. Five, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Five books in the Henry Parker series, and one standalone. So this is eight now. Yeah, second book in this series. And I know you actually as a publisher because, in you know, in your otherwise boring life, um, you founded Polis <laughs> Press and you've published a number yeah. of authors. One of whom, Tori Eldridge, has been a big hit here yeah. at the Poison Pen, and I think her yeah. Ninja Daughter, if I remember right, is uh, our one of our book discussion books coming up next weekend. One of the book clubs is reading the Ninja Daughter, so. Oh, that's wonderful! Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. She, uh, yeah, her the second book in her, uh, her her Lily Wong series just came out uh, last fall, and the third one will come out this fall. So yeah, it's a awesome series, sort of like action adventure about a uh, about a Chinese Hawaiian uh, spy, uh, sort of like. Yeah, so she's fantastic, yeah. Love she's her. very good. We've been lucky to host her both yeah. times, and now we're going to talk about, you know, one of the yeah. difficulties with doing an event like this, whenever you're launching a book or you're right in the early stages of a book tour, you can't really talk about the book, not much. You can, you know, kind of do an introduction <laughs> and lead into it. We can allude, it. allude to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think, you know, book clubs are really satisfactory in the sense that you have to assume, or at least you tell people, they have to have read the whole book so you can talk about many more um, substantive things and get to the end. And oftentimes, reasons I love the book are the way it ends, and so I have to sit here, you know, and mouth platitudes and all because I can't actually say, <laughs> and the reason I love this book is the way that he wound it up, and, you know, there we are. But anyway, let's talk about, um, let's talk about your book. Jason, tell us about Rachel Marin, and, and let's review Hideaway for a minute because some people who are listening yeah. may not have read it. Yeah, sure. So, uh, a Stranger at the Door is the new book. It's the second book in the Rachel Marin series. Uh, Rachel Marin is a, a single mother of two young children. Oh, but Lee is Lee, Lee is my stewardess. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and so basically, Hideaway kicks off. Um, Rachel Marin uh, uh, experiences a horrible, horribly traumatic event that fractures her family, destroys her family, destroys her confidence, and she has to move to a small town with her children to essentially restart her life. And because society has essentially failed her and her family, she basically hones herself into a weapon, both of mind and of body, to be able to protect her family like people otherwise couldn't. Uh, and in the meantime, while she's there, she ends up getting sucked into a murder mystery. The former mayor of, of the town she moved to is, is uh, killed. She figures out that it was murder, not suicide, uh, ends up performing her own investigation, which puts, puts her at odds with the cops for doing the investigation. 
and also sort of threatens to un unveil the actual secret behind who she really is, which she's been keeping secret. And uh, Stranger Than Always is the second book in that series, um, where she sort of found a modicum of peace after the first book, uh, settled down a little bit more, entered into a tentative uh, romantic relationship. Um, but uh, when her son's teacher is brutally murdered, and her son is then taken under the wing of this sort of charismatic businessman who's exploiting young young boys, uh, she has to get involved again, and she is a uh, one woman who you do not want to cross because she will do anything to protect her family. So would you describe her in a way, as a, at least in the first book, as something of a vigilante? I mean, she doesn't have any actual law enforcement authority. You know, I would say she's a reluctant vigilante. She's not Batman. She doesn't sort of want, she doesn't like go into somewhere thinking I'm going to bust some heads. She moves to this new town with every intention of laying low. She does not want to be found. She does not want to be public. She just wants to live her life and keep her family safe. But then when this woman is killed and she's the only one who knows it was murder, she saw the kind of injustice that happened to her own family and she can't let that stand. So she takes it upon herself to do this investigation. So she's a vigilante in that sense where she certainly does look to take the law into her own hands, but she's not sort of like going out at night and skulking around alleyways looking to throw batterings at people. Um, but to me, that's what makes it interesting because she sort of is, she's compelled to do this because she feels it's a wrong that only she can write. Well, I think the small town, or the smaller town anyway, than where she came from, allows that. I read your book back to back with Lisa Gardner's new book, which we're debuting next Tuesday. And in fact, um, in there, we have a, a vigilante, a woman who um, is self assigned to find missing children or missing people. And, um, and she's in Boston, and so she doesn't get much cooperation from the Boston Police Department, who naturally think that they can do a better job. Um, and I, I found it interesting in comparing all of this, you know, to what's going on after the riots at the Capitol where basically all kinds of people, not in law enforcement, are um, using, you know, the internet, facial recognition, all sorts of things to um, at least work alongside informally um, actual law enforcement, try to figure out what's going on. We're probably going to see more of that. Um, so it's not oh, yeah. it's not Absolutely. implausible. Yeah, I mean, there you know there there are a lot more citizen detectives now than there were back in the day. I Absolutely. Mean, you even look at you even look at that the uh, the sort of Twitter alternative Parlor, which was you know is just now shut down as part of this. But there were some citizens who managed to hack Parlor and download their entire however many gigabit archive, so the FBI essentially can sort through and see who's fomenting violence, who's planning something. Uh, and these are just citizens doing this, and it's you know so there are real life so even if they're not going around with like guns and knives they're real life kind of vigilantes out there which is interesting now I'll switch over to lee because you have an actual detective in i'm beginning to whole re rethink that whole thing <laughs> obviously the police don't know what they're doing amateurs are where it's at you know i was just thinking while, while jason was talking how wonderful it would be while well, he was talking about parlor and probably well, it should be parlay right it's french but anyway talk about parlor and and, and how they're downloading gigabytes and, and they're going to hunt down people responsible if you heard a banging at my door and suddenly the FBI swarmed into my office. That would have made this so much more exciting. Instead of a stewardess? <laughs> yes, I, I would have mentioned a stewardess. Oh, never fun. So, let's... I've, written, I've written amateur detectives. I've written yeah. real detectives. I've written talking dolphins. I'm, I'm ready for any variant. <laughs> Obsessive compulsive detectives, invisible detectives. As long as they detect, I'm on board. Well, you do, but you know, one of the things I particularly noticed in both Lost Hills and in this book um, is that you give a lot of credit to um, law enforcement back in Wisconsin for you know yes. helping you come up. And and I wondered why Wisconsin instead of the LAPD. Well, this book emerged in a very the, the first book in this series, Lost Hills, emerged in an unusual way for me. I had another police procedural in mind, and. I attended a homicide investigators training conference, which is not open to civilians. I managed to finagle my way in because I knew the, the guy who was organizing this, this seminar. And the seminar is for professional homicide detectives to get re-education and learn new techniques and just keep up to date on things. So I, I attended this conference just to research the book I had, was intending to write. And a case was presented there as an example of how important it is to approach each homicide as if you've never investigated a homicide before. To forget all your experience, all your homicide investigator common sense, and look at it like a virgin. And how hard that is to do for experienced detectives. And as this particular case was being unveiled or, or explained by the lead detective, 
the uniformed officers who were taking part in it, the blood analysts, the prosecutors, everybody who was involved in the case was presenting. I just became fascinated with it. I, I threw out the book I came there to, to research, mm. and I started thinking about how I could take this particular case and reshape it fictionally. And then, uh, and the character of Eve Ronan began to emerge from the need to have a character who was a virgin to homicide investigation, yet had the exalted role of homicide detective, which you don't get until you have a lot of experience. But you know, one of the fun things about this, this conference was I was asking lots of questions. It was in the dark. You know, no one knew who I was. And you know, during the break, I was asking the lead investigator more questions. And he said, your, your questions are great. May I ask what agency you're with? I said, yes, I'm a senior investigator with the WGA. But I'm not familiar with that law enforcement agency. I said, Writers Guild of America. He went, you're a freaking writer? How the freak did you get in here? And, and he looks at the organizer of the event and kind of went, and, well, if he likes you, I like you. Keep asking good questions. And then that night, I wisely bought drinks for everybody. The, all the detectives and everyone were staying in the same hotel. So all drinks on me. They found out I was from Hollywood. Suddenly, they loved me. And I, I talked to all the detectives involved in that case and said, I, I'm going to make my next book about this. I'm going to fictionalize it. Can I call on you? And they said, yes. And that book became Lost Hills. And it was a huge success for me artistically, creatively, and, and commercially. So in my, my new book, Bone Canyon, I, I still called on some of those experts for background, but there's no big Wisconsin connection in this particular book, except that um, I, I recall, uh, relied upon some of the same uh, law enforcement people. Right. Well, I, I brought it up because there is a disconnect there between Wisconsin and Southern California. But anyway, um, I do think one of the interesting things about this new book is, and by the way, I forgot to mention, we have autographed copies of the books. Jason, did you get yours? Have you I seen? Not yet, no. You haven't gotten them yet. Okay. Um, but anyway, we do have autographed copies in the store of Bone Canyon, and we will have autographed copies will, yes. of the other book. Um, I thought that the the landscape, particularly of Los Angeles, is important in Bone Canyon. I mean, you know, L.A. is full of canyons and well we all know from the fire coverage and all the rest of it how dangerous they can be and how the city has expanded over a landscape that probably is well not probably is not really suited to urban no. development at they, all they've been ho built houses in fire corridors and earthquake areas where right and flood zones you know any place that was empty they built a house or an office building or shopping center it was insane it is insane it is but it's material to the way this book develops so tell us what happens because uh, i think bone canyon's a great title for it well thank you um one of the challenges i had writing a police procedural set in los angeles is there are so many other people who've written great police procedurals in los angeles yeah. you know michael connelly and raymond chandler and joseph wambaugh and, and it, I, I was Robert Crace. You know, what could I possibly? And millions of TV shows that have been shot here. How could I possibly portray Los Angeles any differently? So I chose to set my book in the Lost Hills jurisdiction of the LA County Sheriff's Department, which is sort of an island within Los Angeles mm -hmm. that is geographically interesting and sociologically and culturally interesting because this island contains the Panga Canyon. Malibu, Hidden Hills, Calabasas, the Santa Monica Mountains, mountains, beaches, rural areas, celebrities, poor people. It, it's great. It's, it was wonderful for my needs. While I was writing Lost Hills, I, I came up with this notion of a giant blaze roaring through the Santa, Santa Monica Mountains. It was entirely fictional. That blaze happened while I was editing the galleries of Lost Hills, exactly the way I described, I should say. And it just you know, amazed me, the coincidence of it. For the second book, Bone Canyon, I was inspired by the fact that after the fires denuded the Santa Monica Mountains, all that was left was this black landscape, a bunch of bones were discovered. It, it turned out that for years, gang members and other murderers have been killing people and tossing their bodies in the canyons and no one's noticed because the brush is so thick. Right. So now that the brush has all been burned away, bones were tumbling down into people's backyards and launching all sorts of investigations. That wasn't all nefarious. There was a, a woman who had Alzheimer's who wandered away from a museum in uh, mid Wilshire and ended up in a, in a canyon. There was a, a couple who got lost driving back from LAX and their car was found in the canyon years later. But it was a great starting off point for me 
for, for Bone Canyon. Bone Canyon itself doesn't exist. I, I created a fictional canyon comprised of two real canyons in, in uh, the Lost Hills jurisdiction. You know, just because I had some fictional needs that the real canyons weren't, weren't giving. So what happened is bones surface, and then it, it occurs to Eve that maybe if these bones surface, there might be more bodies and more bones. And one thing leads to another. And I, I think it's a really interesting, you know, sequential investigation. You start with one thing and then it begins to blossom up into, into more and more. And entirely believable. I think of the story not as a who nutted, but as you said, an unfolding. It was like yeah. the Spencer for Hire episodes I, I used to write early in my career. It's not, here's a murder, four suspects, Cesar Romero did it. I mean, it's, it's more of the... Something is, 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 is slowly unpeeling, but there are other repercussions, other things you have to deal with. It's not in a vacuum. And because uh, I think if you're just doing a straightforward police procedural, it could be boring. So the, the story, the procedure, has to reveal aspects of your, character, your hero, your protagonist, that wouldn't otherwise be revealed. That I think what people remember is not so much the mystery of the procedure, but the character and how he or she is involved in the case and what their stakes are and what the case reveals about him or her. Well, I agree. So, Jason, um, I really am fond of investigations. I like, I like those as the spine of the narrative, and I like to be led across a path. I'm not, I'm not huge on this whole domestic suspense, the psychological thriller, where or I just read two books back to back where the lead character is paralyzed by traumatic events in their youth, and so it's all about, you know trying to get to terms with all of that. It, it, I'm, I'm much more interested in actual investigations. Must be my logical mind. So what attracts you to this particular form of crime fiction? One of the great things about crime fiction is how protein it is. You can write so many different kinds of stories within this large, under this large umbrella. Yeah, I mean, to me, it was sort of starting with the character first and foremost is that I, I love the investigation part too, but I wanted to write a character because I feel like sometimes a lot of times when you're in sort of whether it's detective fiction or thriller fiction or suspense fiction, the main characters can be sort of like loners. They're the people who can like, they close down the bar at 3 a.m., they're going out and getting to fights in alleys, they're going out and screwing around or whatever it is. I want to take a very different path in that what if you had a character in a crime novel who wanted to be a part of that investigation but had two children, small children, who were, depend who were dependent on her fully. So she can't go out to the bar and close down 3 a.m. She can't go out like Batman skulking around tonight because she has to go home and make dinner. She has to get these kids ready for school. She has to make sure they're doing their homework. She has to make sure her son, who witnessed this traumatic event and has literally scarred him for life, how he is basically in this book not functioning. Um, so she has all these responsibilities on top of her actual desire to solve, solve a murder. So I thought that'd be a really interesting conflict right after that. How do you balance being somebody who wants to see justice done, who wants to find a killer, who wants to make sure that, uh, that like I said, justice is done, but at the same time, every move you make reverberates within her own family. Every step she takes, every criminal she sees, she could be exposing her children to that danger, herself that into danger, and if something happens to her, her children are orphaned. And so I thought that'd be really interesting like to start a series like that with somebody who's sort of tethered to two people who depend on her because she can't go about investigation the same way somebody does to sort of untether who's sort of a loner. And to me, that just, that really appealed to me. And I thought it was a different kind of character, putting a different kind of character into that sort of investigative framework and see how, how she affected the investigation, but also how the investigation affected her and her family. Well, you also have, um, for somebody like her, a real serious question about how much risk can she run because if oh, something yeah. happens to her you know her children yeah. are the ones who are going to pay for that and that that's a question that has dogged a lot of writers in writing uh, particularly women characters or women who become mothers um, even in the cozy genre you know it it comes up as how much yeah. how much danger can um, a woman with children dependent on her run and it comes up for men too in a in a different yeah. way um, but I wanted to really lean into that and, and, and say right off the bat, she may be exposing herself and her family, and there are certain risks that she's taking that are maybe not worth it, but 
there's a part of her that's sort of broken too that what she went through at the beginning of hideaway she hasn't recovered from that either she might have sort of like steeled her mind and body but she is by no means sort of emotionally whole so she takes risks that maybe she shouldn't because she thinks she's doing the right thing but i like the fact that she's flawed because she makes rash decisions and spur of the moment decisions that in hindsight may not be for the best but like us, she is only going based on her gut and the information she has in hand. But I like the idea of just sort of somebody who wasn't always going to make the right decision, who you could potentially second guess and she could even second guess herself. So what about what about Eve? Has she got um, family and baggage over there, Lee? Or? She does. I mean, a lot of the things that Jason just said, I, I'm nodding because I totally agree with it. I, I'm so tired of the middle-aged detective who's got a deep, dark past, his family was oh, yeah. murdered by a serial killer, you know, he lost a, no, a nostril in the war, or whatever. <laughs> they're haunted, they're alcoholics, they're drug addicts, they're they're not appreciated by their bosses, but they're deductive geniuses, they're brilliant yeah. at their jobs. And I, Like Jason just said, I, I wanted to humanize my character, bring the, the, the heroine down to earth. She has a family, she has brothers and sisters, she doesn't know it all. She makes huge mistakes, especially because she's in a job she doesn't deserve and doesn't have the experience for. She has the innate skill, but that skill has not quite been marshaled yet. And for me as a writer, it's fun to see her make mistakes. It's fun to see her not know it all and kind of stumble into it or, or, or see what she overlooked. Because that gives me a way, to, a room to grow, something to write toward. It gives me conflict. It gives me many more books, I hope, to write. And gives me facets of her character that, that I haven't explored yet and don't know the answers to. And I, I also like having my character be human in, in a physical sense. She gets injured, and those injuries don't go away overnight. They can linger into other books, and they, they linger throughout the book. I think that makes her more realistic to the reader. And also, I believe that humor is important. I think even in the worst situations in our lives, there's humor. And I can give you examples from my own life where... You know, horrible sad things that there's also a humorous side to it and I think humor humanizes characters and, and also invests the reader in who they are and that was especially true in, in Monk you know where you had a character with an obsessive compulsive disorder who was a very sad character but the humor you know, made you love him and vice versa I, I think that balance is, is very important and it's missing in so many crime novels there, there are so many crime novels that are obsessively dark and unrelentingly grim and just can you light it up for a second or, or bring in a brother or a sister or, a, or like Jason said you have to go home and make dinner or you have other obligations besides just mm -hmm. the case and I think that's refreshing and I think it's it's yeah. uh, challenging for writers to um, bring in more real life and less fantasy as far as their detective heroes are concerned well yeah. some of you know some of the iconic detectives in the past we were talking to Jeff Lindsay uh, Monday night and Travis McGee kept up and I, I was also thinking about Lou Archer they were basically unaffected by the events of the previous book you know it was like they just reset to zero um, every book well Reacher's somewhat like that too um, you touched up with, with Travis McGee though I mean I read all of them yeah and well, what always struck about Travis McGee is, is he would be re uh, touched emotionally in the book he was always rescuing these wounded birds you know Women who who've been brutalized in so many ways, you know, gang raped, their families killed, whatever, and he'd bring them on the busted flush, and by spending three weeks on his boat, doing his laundry, doing his cooking, and having sex with them three times a day, they would be healed, and then they'd leave him, and poor Travis would be mourning these wounded birds who left his boat, and he'd sit with Meyer Meyer and you know, and, and and drink about how he's he's dealing with this loss. It's like you massaging his pig. <laughs> well. Yeah, but there were, you know, there was a certain, I mean, they were formulaic in that sense, and there was a certain comfort for readers in, um, in, in knowing yeah. what to expect to, to go back to it. I also wanted to say, in, in, one of the things about um, somebody who's not on salary, so to speak, you know, how do you deal with the income question? I mean, what, you know, Eva's got a salary as a, as a cop, but Rachel... Um, in addition to all these other considerations, what is she doing for income? Do you have to set her up in some way to have independent income so she has the leisure to parent her children and detect? 
Well, so in, uh, in Hideaway, uh, you, as you sort of start to learn Rachel's backstory, you learn that she does have money, and it's for, there, there, there's a reason for it. She was not wealthy when the book starts, but then due to the circumstances, I don't want to place, I don't want, I want to allude to things without giving away too many spoilers. But her family underwent a terrible trauma, and as the book goes on, you learn that it could have been prevented, and she essentially. There's a reason that she has money, and it ties into the fact that, and there's part of the reason that she doesn't trust anybody. And one of the conflicts in the first book and in the second one, too, is that she doesn't trust law enforcement for a very legitimate reason because of what happens in Hideaway. But due to the circumstances surrounding it, what happens to her in Hideaway, she does come into some money because of what happens to her. So I, wanted, I don't want to give too much away, but there's a reason that she's able to support herself and her children, you know, without launching an OnlyFans account. Right. Well, and financial I mean, considerations play a role in, in the Ronan books, too. Yes, she's salaried by the L.A. County Sheriff's Department, but she could lose her job at any moment. Plus, again, I don't want to give away spoilers and stuff, but she gets herself into trouble that results in a lawsuit. And she ends up basically allowing, not allowing, but uh, entertaining the notion of optioning her story to Hollywood because of the money, because she may need the money. She may not have a job, or she may need to fend off legal issues. So the finance, and plus she has family that could use the money. So there are financial issues swirling around Eve as well. She used, the, the way Eve got into the homicide um, division of the, of the Sheriff's Department, was well, she was a deputy off-duty who saw a famous movie star beating up a woman, and she arrested him off-duty, and, and it was captured by people with cell phones, and that, that video went viral, and she was able to leverage that popularity to get into homicide. And now, after events in Lost Hills, she has that also that she can leverage. And now Hollywood is sniffing around her, wanting to make a movie or a TV show about her life. So she's dealing with not only the financial temptation, but also the, the problem of, do I want to have my life mythologized and have to deal with that at the same time? I'm because being a cop is all she wants. She doesn't want to have anything to do with Hollywood. And there's a lot of pressure financially and otherwise for her to do so. So money does play a part and is a consideration for my character as well. I thought about that. We were watching, um, it's hard to get, but um, years ago there was a wonderful dramatization of Dorothy Sayers' um, three of the four Peter Whimsey and Harriet Vane books ending up with Gowdy Night in Oxford. And you recognize all the way through that the question of money never comes in. Lord Peter, you know, is um, from an extremely wealthy family, and in his way, he's a, he's not a dilettante of crime, but he can afford. I mean, so they those kinds of books brushed aside the whole question of whether there was any income or any monetary questions um, facing um, the sleuth. And you know, clerical sleuths, I were I think had a had a heyday for that reason in part too. That you know, it was part of their job, and they were getting a paycheck to poke into crime, Father Brown, all those sorts of things. But, you know, you're why writing... Why millionaires want to solve crimes? I mean, why are the hearts and... Uh, well, Nick and Nora. Houston I mean, hey, and Nick, 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 Nick and Nora, Nora were the great, I mean, one of the greatest, you know, crime-solving couples of all time. They were great. Or, yep. you know, Mary Higgins Clark's The Lottery Winners, which I was hired to adapt yeah. many years ago for Lifetime. Right. You have these, these old elderly people who win the lottery, and the first thing they want to do is solve murders. I mean, i got to say, if I won $65 million... The first thing I would do is not open up a private detective agency and spend, <laughs> spend all my time hunting killers. It's just that wouldn't be fun for me. Well, that's I because say, if you read the, if you read these PI novels, none of them ever start out with the the PI sitting behind a desk thinking like I have all my financial affairs in order. You right. never start like that. Yeah. It's always like I'm eight months behind on rent. Mm -hmm. I owe three different I owe three different child support payments. I have seventeen ex wives. And if this person comes in and I get this job, I'm going to get a hundred dollars that's going to help pay off all of that. Right. And, Plus, you know, I'm an addict, and you know, where am I going yeah, to get these my? Are not, these are not the most. These are not the most financially savvy characters. That's yeah. why the Rockford Files are so groundbreaking. In the pilot, the first thing he did was run a credit check on his client. He was always <laughs> about the money, which was so unlike <laughs> Mannix and Barnaby Jones and Cannon and everybody else on TV at the time. It was so refreshing to see a detective who never had money and would always put the money first. 
I love the Roxford Files. I still miss Mr. Cannell. We were so fortunate yeah. that he used to come and see us. And, and in fact, the only time I ever had lunch on a private jet was when Stephen flew into the Scottsdale Airport and invited me up for lunch. <laughs> so we, you know, we ate it catered on his wonderful plane. And I was, I was really fond of him, and I thought that he had some wonderful television um, backgrounds. So... We miss him. Um, let me ask Patrick if he has any questions arising from viewers. Patrick, do you? Well, not not a lot of questions yet, but uh, actually I have a question for you both about, um, you know, you both juggle the demands of writing full-time and, and also both uh, working as publishers. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you, how you manage to, to juggle those two worlds? How do you uh, being a publisher and a writer at the same yeah, time? Yeah, how, how, how do you do it all? It's a, it is the greatest procrastination excuse I've ever come up with. <laughs> oh, I can't work on the book now. I have to edit this other one or approve this cover or, or read these galleries or negotiate this contract or talk to this bookseller. Uh, I have found in general anyway, because I'm always working in television and in, in books at the same time, that I have I've sort of divided my life in that during the day I do all the business of, of writing in the evening I do my writing. That's not to say I don't write during the day, but that's when I'll, I'll work on brash book stuff or I'll, I'll work on scripts and uh, promotional stuff, marketing, that kind of thing. Somehow it all gets done, but I, I don't know about, about Jason, but it's not me by myself at Brash. We have employees, there are people doing a lot of the other busy work, so I, I can just select the fun stuff for me, you know, the editing the books and some of the promotion and approving covers. I don't necessarily have to get into the the, the nitty gritty that is time consuming and not nearly as much fun. I mean, it's it's tricky for me. I'll, I'll say that. So we do we do have one other uh, editor who uh, editor who acquires for our Agora imprint, which is dedicated to sort of diverse and underrepresented voices. Uh, we also have a distributor who we work with a lot of the sales and marketing people. Um, but my day is basically split between. I'd say between polis and between writing, uh, depending on what I'm working on at any given time. But, you know, it's funny because I try to keep writing and publishing as separate as possible, which is not always very possible because it's this, basically the same industry. You're just sitting on, on two sides of the, of the desk. Um, and there are times when, like, I'm working on final edits for a book that's due next week, but at the same time, like, some a fire comes up at polis or there's a delay at the printer or we need these materials and all of a sudden it's like, you have to interrupt that to do this. Um, so there's never any perfect split, you know, add to that, I have, I have a two-year-old and a three-year-old at home during a pandemic, and there's no free time whatsoever. You know, I have two children who are not self-sufficient in any way whatsoever. So, you know, I could be saying that all of a sudden it's like, you got a diaper to change, you got a bath, nobody wants to eat, they want us, one kid wants to watch this show, the other kid wants to watch this show. So it's just, it's madness 24-7, um, which is why I, I drink a whole lot. <laughs> So as publishing professionals, what do you see the pandemic has changed? I'm getting submitted a lot of crappy books that people have written in a hurry. Uh, Wait, is that different? <laughs> it just seems like the crap level is a whole lot higher now. Uh, well, now is my time to write a book. I'll just regurgitate, I mean, just vomit the worst stuff on the screen as I possibly can and send it to Lee since Jason's busy changing a diaper. Um, <laughs> I, mean, for, I think for writers in general, the pandemic has been the opportunity to take on that project you've always wished to, to do if you just had more time on your hands. So that's been good to, to some degree. Uh, but as, as a publisher, I think the biggest problem we have right now, for, speaking for myself, is just getting notice for your books, getting them reviewed, getting them promoted, getting the books out there, especially if you're small. You just don't have the kind of promotional muscle Simon & Schuster and some of the bigger houses have. Um, that's the only real you know, stumbling block is sales and promotion, I think, um, right now, as opposed to before the pandemic. I mean, I would agree. As, as an independent publisher, that's always the tricky thing, is that you, you can't compete on a financial resource level with the big five or, or soon to be big four. Um, so you have to essentially be creative. And the, the, the benefit to being creative is that you can think outside the box and make decisions at a far quicker the problem is that you don't always have the resources to do it, and creativity can distract from a lot of other different things. Um, but right now, like there are no in-store events. I, I would say one of the things that we really did well with in-store events, um, you know, when we launched Agora, especially, like we had a lot of publicity for those books. They were in Entertainment Weekly. They were in, 
New York Post and Book Riot and all these great places. We actually got really good turnouts to independent bookstores for these authors, and now we can't do that. Um, so as an, I feel like as an independent publisher, we have really strong support among independent booksellers, but now, given the circumstances, every bookseller sort of has the weight of the world on them, just essentially trying to stay in business. Um, and whereas they might have had extra time or resources to help push another author or do this or do that, they're, they have a thousand at the same time. Um, so it's, it's certainly trickier, and you're always fighting for review space and publicity space with every other publisher out there. I'm, I, like, even though I might not have the resources of Penguin, Random House, Simon & Schuster, Old Spring, Bertelsmann, uh, I'm fighting for the same review space. I'm fighting for the same blog coverage. Um, and it's, it's just, I think, heightened right now because there's so, you know, there's no in-person stuff and the news cycles are just absolutely absurd. So getting hurt, above, getting hurt above the wind tunnel is almost impossible. Well, I think for both Jason and I, what's great is that we're both authors. And, you know, look at us right now. We have books out. We're trying to get notice amidst <laughs> a, a pandemic, an insurrection, all these other things taking attention away from, from the most important thing, which is buying our books. I know how my authors feel. And... <laughs> Yes. I, I can relate to them, and, and they actually find that comforting. It's not just, I'm not a suit. You know, I'm, I'm not a, a feeling editor. I'm just like them. So I, I know exactly what they're going through, and, and I think that's a good thing. I think that gives Jason and I a, a, a special edge and a special relationship with the authors we, we publish. Yep. They know how much we care. We know the insecurity they're feeling, and they know how hard we're trying to get their books out there, and we're thinking out of the box, and whatever we're learning yes. from our own promotion of our own books we're bringing back to promote their books so it's, yeah. it's an interesting position for both Jason and me and it's also like if I send an author an editorial letter I've got I've, I've gotten many editorial letters so if I send an author an editorial letter they're like maybe a little like you have a, you know a, I love the book but there's a lot to do here and I've been on that side of it too so I can sort of like put it and then sort of know when to say the right things, know when somebody needs to be talked down off a ledge, know when somebody needs a little bit of a pick-me-up. Um, and it's sort of weird to be both in a position as an author where occasionally you need that, and then as a publisher where you're doing that too. It's sort of like you're the therapist and the patient at the same time. And because I'm a crime writer, I know the challenges they're facing, and I can give them solutions. I see what you're going for here and why you didn't get it. Why don't you try this? Or here's a mistake you've made. I've made that mistake before, and I know how it ends. <laughs> And so I can talk to them writer to writer, not necessarily editor to writer or publisher to writer, but as if we're in a book or something, you know, sharing our woes, I can talk shop with my authors and they appreciate it. We can talk about character and dialogue and structure and, and the clues and, and the narrative engine of the story. And, and I, can, I can speak a language they understand, but I also will understand their frustration. And if they can't get understand something, I can help them overcome that obstacle. And, and oddly enough, it helps me. When I send a writer a, a detailed editorial letter about what's wrong with their book, it makes me think about my own writing and my own book in a new way. I come away from those conversations a better writer, too. I, I'm able to confront my own problems or laziness or cliches or, or whatever, and I go back to my own writing, oddly enough, invigorated. You talk about how do we run a publishing company and still write our books, in some ways, the publishing company has made me a better and more productive and more creative writer. Sure. I can really see the synchronicity in what you're talking about. What we certainly have experienced here is that, you know, the options for people to randomly discover things are greatly diminished. We haven't had an open bookstore since um, Thanksgiving because the Arizona is just, you know, horrendous and and we have some political um, issues, masks and so forth, that I don't want my staff to have to deal with. And we're doing fine being closed. But what happens is, and it's particularly true of the paperbacks, that they just aren't, people are not wandering in and picking them up in the way that they would have before. And so what I see is that there's sort of a push towards the blockbuster you know, because inevitably there are only so many books that Patrick and I can highlight. There are only so many events we can do. God knows we're doing sometimes like three a day. Um, and and those books are dominating and a lot of good books yeah. are being left um, I, I think to fend for themselves. 
I think that's one of the most underreported things about this whole pandemic is that there are all these reports about how the publishing industry did surprisingly better over the past year than people expected. I think the flip side of that is like exactly like you said, yeah. people are spending their money on the blockbusters, on the tried and true stuff. They're spending money, so like the John Grishams are doing better and the Dan Browns are doing better, but people aren't because it's affected. And even if it isn't affected, they don't know that it won't be. So people are taking their hard-earned money and they're spending it on something that they know what they're getting as opposed to they're not going to spend $26 on a debut that they may or may not like because they don't have that disposable income anymore. Really affecting people who are sort of like still trying to make a name for themselves. People who are already on the top are staying on the top. They're the tried and trues. They're the, they're the comfort food. It's the sort of, it's the, the, like I said, the debuts or the people that in what used to be the mid list. It's like people aren't trying that anymore because they don't want to risk it. But well, we're good trying. Thing you and I are blockbusters, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to mix it up. We we try very hard to highlight debuts in you know as well as established authors yeah. and you know. But there's only so much we can do. Um, and if every bookstore is doing as well, um, there's some hope. But it's difficult to know exactly how we're going to come out on the other side of this. And um, I'm curious to see how. Well, oh, Patrick, I'm sorry we digressed. Anything else oh. that you wanted to throw out there? Well, um, it seems like in, uh, Detective or Inspector Monk would be perfectly suited to a pandemic era adventure. He's he's been preparing for this the entire time. <laughs> Is there any talk about bringing him back? Actually, Tony Shalhoub and Andy Breckman, who created Monk, did uh, a Monk reunion oh, early really? in the pandemic, and it's wonderful. You can find it, I think, on YouTube. Oh. Monk is been preparing for this forever. He, this is. Finally, everyone's thinking like him. His day has come. It's a great uh, short. So I, I recommend that you all take a look at it. The whole cast got together again for it. It's, it's great fun. That sounds terrific. And you know what else I like? There's a new, the French are doing the most remarkable television and crime fiction. And there's a new thing, I think it's on Netflix and not MHC, called Lupin. And you oh, know, it's yeah. based on Arsène Lupin. But I'm really pleased to see that um, some of the aspects of crime fiction, like you know, the burglar or the heist or the wrong end of the gun guy and all, um, are are making a comeback. And I don't know if you've watched Call My Agent, which is I think one of the best things on television. I'm just blown away by the writing. It keeps my going. My wife is French. Call My Agent have been on here nonstop. Plus the Bureau. Yeah. Fantastic espionage show from France. There's five seasons and they're all great. Yeah, no, I think they've had... I, I, am, I have watched Frozen 2 147 I'll bet you have. times. I know. When my brother was a baby, I had to... And I think it was like 14 weeks there. I saw it wasn't that I minded Peter Pan 14 consecutive Saturdays, but Bear Country, the short that went with it, really got old after repeated viewings. But that's our kids. If are. I never see a Teletubby again in my life, I will be happy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, my child, they had the worst kid stuff of it. it was just it was hell. It was torture. Oh. Well, Paw Patrol, Paw Patrol. Like I, these, it's it's a it's a fashion show. It's like it is a show purposefully designed to make to like just sell toys. And we have way I, I step on more little Paw Patrol toys than I do carpet. It's it's. it's <laughs> so why don't we wind up by asking you if um you have another book in each of these series coming forth? Here, but presumably next year. Is there a third book coming out for Rachel? Uh, that's what I'm hopefully working on right now, and I, you know, I hope so. Good. I hope so. And there is a third Eve Ronin. It's called Gated Prey. It's finished. It's coming out in October of 2021, and I'm hoping they let me do a fourth one. It, I guess it depends on how well Bone Canyon does. So all of you, buy three or four signed copies right now if you want to see Eve Ronin return. There you for go. A fourth adventure. Well, Patrick, anything else before we quit? Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, author Boyd Morrison has been tuned in here, and he has a question, and Barbara can probably weigh in on this too. Uh, since since you're both in publishing, where do you think the trends in thrillers are going? Uh, we had the unreliable narrator for a while. What's next? I do have an answer, but I'll be happy to hear yours. I don't know. To be honest with you, with the way the world is going right now, I can't imagine writing an international political thriller because if I had 
If I'd plotted what just happened, no one would have believed me. Oh, Lee, it's not possible for a bunch of people to to, to storm the Capitol. It's just ridiculous. You know, it, I, you know, I had that Ian Ludlow series of international action adventure stuff, and, and I'm kind of relieved I don't have to write one right now because how do you top what's, what's going on? How do you write something that will grab the imagination in a thriller, will grab the imagination in a stronger way than what's happening right now on CNN and Fox and everything else? It's a challenge. Uh, I really think it's, it's a, a... I think the for me, I don't ask myself what's the next wave. I, I always start with character. What kind of character do I want to explore, and what story will 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 do that for me? And and then the story and the character are kind of bound together, and comes from that. I don't try to predict the big next thing. I, I think one of the things that we've seen that we've seen opposed to, and I guess this might be on more of a, is that sort of a trend towards more traditional mysteries, sort of like the locked room, the clue, the. Uh, there's a, been a huge Agatha Christie resurgence, you know, with the movies and everything. Um, we've we've done really well. We've tested some books. And we've seen like people just sort of want they want something maybe a little more comfort food, not big suspense where it's like lots of bodies piled up or um, you know domestic violence or things like that, but sort of more traditional mysteries, you know. Um, and I think that's maybe because of everything that's going on, people want something that's maybe a little more, I guess, low key than sort of like the running around shooting guns kind of thing. Now, so I have a as far as like, we're, we're getting that too. But my reaction to it has been, God, it's so derivative. I mean, I'm getting the, the same amateur detectives and, and, and cops that yeah. I've seen a thousand times. Me looking at it going, oh, warm and familiar. I'm thinking, God, please stop submitting the same old, same old to me. Let's see something yeah. fresh and new. And I don't know what that fresh and new is, but I'm, I'm tired of seeing the same old. Um, maybe also, there's a way to get those same values and same yeah. pleasures, but in a new way of telling a story. Like, take Mumbo. Well, so for us, oh, 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 yeah. Both, well, those, so for, uh, both those franchises took something comforting, the whodunit, and found a unique character and framework for telling a traditional story. I guess maybe that's what I'm looking yeah. for in a manuscript. I'm looking for a strong, fresh voice and point of view and, and a, a, a propulsive mystery, but not the same old, you know, the, the yeah. woman in the village who... who sells flowers and she finds a body in, in, in her vegetable garden and off she goes. I mean, we, so one of the things that, that worked for us is, so we just published a book uh, maybe two months ago called A Will to Kill by an author named R.B. Rahman, which, who's, which is set in India. And he's an Indian author, lives in India, and it's essentially he took an ag, he, he was, grew up loving Agatha Christie in India, and essentially said, I, I've never read a book like this set in India. So he wrote his own Agatha Christie type sort of lock room mystery set in a manor in India. And it's not like, you know, a, a upscale British castle. Uh -huh. It's not at some country club. And to us, that's what was very, actually, this is, so, this is sort of on the DL, but there's a very exciting review for this book coming out in this weekend's a very big, a very big newspaper. So that's fantastic. That. But, but that was, that was to us, like, it took that framework of the sort of traditional Agatha Christie novel, but set it somewhere that we had never seen before, and he did it fantastically. So, I'm not saying it's sort of like traditional Miss Marple, you know, but Anthony Horowitz has been doing, doing really well oh, yeah. this with the um, the Magpie murder, stuff like that. So, I wouldn't be shocked if there's sort of a trend towards more low-key mysteries, because I think people are just tired of all the pyrotechnics. They kind of want to sit in their chair with a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and get lost in a book. Not to say that all the, all the other stuff won't do well, but maybe people are looking for something a little more cozy than they have in the past. I brought up Anthony Horowitz, because that's a perfect example. He's taken these yeah. old-fashioned structures and brought a whole new spin. The, the other series he's doing where he's the Watson, Anthony Horowitz, writer-producer of Foil's War and Midsummer Murders, is, is solving crimes with a, a detective. And so he's playing himself solving crimes, and yet he's, t he's still telling a traditional mystery but he's also bringing into it his experience writing mysteries for Foyle's War and all these other series and his own experience writing Moriarty and, and, and Sherlock Holmes. And yes, it, it satisfies on every level, but it's fresh and new with a unique voice and a, a special point of view. And yeah. I'm not publishing it, but boy, I love it as a reader. It's fantastic. Well, Jason, I think that's as Jason. a both a publisher and as a reader, you're always looking for just something that feels a little bit different. And and yeah, and people always say like if I'm on a conference, like what are you looking for? And I say this is sort of a bit of a cop out, but like I'm not going to know what I'm looking for until I see it. Yeah, Jason, I was just going to say kudos for doing uh, Gary's book. 
that Matthew yes, Henson. Yeah. That's just a blast. Gary, that's a per- that's a perfect example of this. Is that Gary Phillips, who's basically like a, a not just in crime writing, but graphic novels and comic books. He's written for TV. He took a, a real life character, Matthew Henson, who in real life was the first African American man to visit um, to visit the North Pole, and he essentially wrote this sort of like Flash Gordon. Uh, Indiana Jones-esque historical adventure featuring this character of Matthew Henson. So he took a real-life adventurer and put him into sort of this crazy historical madcap adventure. He meets real people. He meets Tesla. Um, and he just... It was unlike anything we'd ever seen before. And it's such a cool, it's such a cool book. Wonderful. So, boy, an answer. My answer is the Gothic. The Gothic, if you're paying any attention, is making an enormous comeback. Yeah. And um, that's another form that we, you know, can thank Daphne du Maurier and Rebecca, but it goes back way into the 19th century. But I have read an absolute panoply of new Gothic mysteries recently. And the downside one, and the one I really dislike, and I have read three of them in the last week, is the new Bad Seed Thriller. And I am not a fan of this genre. I really do not want to read um, about... What is a bad seed thriller? So a bad seed it. thriller is... Um, the, one of the ones I just read is what is the mother to do if she thinks that... It, it's actually like the William Lancy book. You remember the William Landy book? Oh, where, no. All right, so okay. basically this is a mother trying to confront the idea that she has given birth to a sociopath or has she not and she's overreacting and I have to say at this moment in time I am just not interested in reading books like that the gothic great is wonderful escape but um, I, you know well I'm not going to be political but let's just say we have examples in front of us of this kind of person and I just don't want to I don't want to spend any more time Barbara with have you read Emily Danforth's Plain Bad Heroines uh, no, I know, I know what it is, and I think that one's intended to be humorous. I'm you know, it's, actually, it's, 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 it crosses lots of genres. It's right. a lesbian YA. Right. It's a gothic. It's a horror novel. Yep. No, I them. haven't, but I'd, I'd like to. I was referring oh, to so another good. book. Yeah. No, it's I so think, refreshing. I mean, yeah, it's it's unlike anything I've read before. It's great when you find something that has a truly original voice. So, gentlemen, it's really been a pleasure to talk to you both again. I'm glad we were able to do this. And maybe next book will be actually, it'll be possible for you to show up live, which should be very exciting. But meantime, I'm well, glad that we have this technology. So thank you both for joining us. And thank I thank you. all of you who've thank been you. watching thank it. You, um, thank you very, very much. And don't forget, we have autographed copies of both books recommend and if you missed the first books grab a copy of Lost Hills and Hideaway which will not be autographed but nonetheless great reading so good night everybody thanks for joining us bye guys bye bye thanks everyone here we go that went fine you're right they can talk forever yeah.